Hello? Well, there we go. The microphone works. Good afternoon. The doors are closing. The, my smartphone is telling us we're ready to begin. So welcome to, uh, and I guess here we go. Good afternoon and welcome to our event. It's um, wonderful to have you all gathered here today. And uh, I'm also, I'd also like to extend a welcome to those who are tuning in or dialing into this event from across Canada. Thank you for your, for your presence here. My name is Ian Bailey. I'm a reporter with the Globe and Mail's Ottawa Bureau and the uh, author and editor of the Globe and Mail's Politics Briefing newsletter published uh, five days a week. I hope you'll all uh, subscribe. I'll be moderating the first half of uh, this event today on P3s. My colleague, uh, Menachem Raman Wilms, the host of the Globe and Mail's Decibel podcast, which is also a, uh, an excellent uh, broadcast worth listening, worth listening to, will be moderating the second half of our gathering today. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional unceded territory of the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Métis Nation, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We're grateful to have the opportunity to uh, work and to live on this land. Over the course of the next few hours, we're going to be talking about public-private partnerships, of course. It's an important topic, and as there's growing recognition that we need everyone at the table to solve issues such as access to housing, health care, climate change. And our speakers today will be talking to that, and we hope, obviously, you'll be joining in with questions and such. Speakers today will be sharing examples of successful partnerships. They'll be offering their views on how we might improve approaches to P3s. Mitchell Cohen, the CEO of the Daniels Corporation, will close out the event. And after that, obviously, we'd welcome and love for you to stay for a drink and some network in this uh, beautiful space here overlooking the city. Um, of course, your input and your views were part of this process, part of this gathering, and we'd like to invite you to join the conversation. Um, if you have a question during presentations, raise your hand and when it's time, um, when, raise your hand when it's time for questions, of course, and a microphone will be brought over to you for you to ask questions. And for those in the virtual audience, you can type your question into the Q&A section of the, uh, of the um, box, the Q&A box. Um, on behalf of the Globe and Mail, I'd like to thank Novo Nordisk for making today's, develop, today's uh, event and gathering possible. Uh, Novo Nordisk has its global headquarters in Denmark, so we thought it would be great to invite the Danish ambassador to Canada, Her Excellency Hane Fugel Eskia, to provide official greetings. Uh, the ambassador can't be here in person today due to her schedule, but she has sent along her remarks, and so I'm going to turn it over to the ambassador for the next few moments. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much to the Globe and Mail for this opportunity to welcome all of you to the event today dedicated to public-private partnerships in Canada. These kind of partnerships, where private and public stakeholders work together towards a common goal and with an aim to find solutions that benefit our citizens is an approach that is deeply ingrained in the Danish society. Actually, Many of our current solutions and ambitious steps taken in the direction of a fast track green transition are based on public private partnerships. And we also have a long experience with this approach in the life sciences sector. In addition to an established tradition for public private partnerships in Denmark, a wide range of Danish companies are foundation owned. This means that they have a commitment to reinvest a significant part of their earnings back into society, focusing on increasing access to the latest care by supporting innovation through research, grants, community investments, and more. And this tradition for reinvestment is of great value to a small society such as the Danish. A high level of quality of life and innovation require actually the collaboration of all levels of society. So when Denmark launched our life sciences growth plan in 2018 and later our life sciences strategy in 2020, 
and now developing our next version of the strategy. Private stakeholders were and are still invited to the policy table to give their recommendations and input to our strategic work. The strategy today includes initiatives that will work towards combining a strong safety net in our society, but also a strong economy within the life sciences sector. The current strategy also includes the establishment of a national life science council to ensure a more dynamic approach that allows us to address changing societal needs, adapt to emerging challenges such as a pandemic, and ensure that the full potential of the public and private sector is realized at all times. Similarly to the newly established Ontario Life Sciences Council, the Danish Council includes representation from a broad spectrum of stakeholders, including representatives from the life sciences industry and academia. We also include government representatives as well as patient organizations, all benefiting from the trust that has been built between the public and private sector over many decades of of collaboration. And I believe that trust is the key factor for these partnerships to be successful. To deal with challenges, and of course such challenges do arise, a high level of transparency and accountability is necessary to build the respect between partners and in order to obtain that necessary level of trust. It also requires that all partners approach the task at hand with a mindset where we accept compromises and where everyone is ready to make concessions in the interest of achieving the overarching goal of providing the best possible quality of life for our citizens. This is also the approach of the Team Denmark here in Canada. And you are always welcome to reach out to us if you're interested in hearing more about the Danish approach and our lessons learned when it comes to public and private partnerships. So thank you very much for your time. And I wish you all a very productive and enlightening event. And I hope lots of networking. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to the ambassador. I'd like to introduce our first presenter in the room. It's, um, as many of us recognize, it's always great to hear different perspectives from around the world, other jurisdictions, to gather ideas uh, to potentially implement at home here in Canada. Therefore, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome to the stage Dorothy Kais, partner, architect, and business area manager with Architima. Welcome to Dorothy. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for inviting uh, me and Agitima here to join your discussion today. And I'm very honored uh, that it's, we're actually doing the opening with the architectural perspective um, to kick off this, uh, this uh, interesting discussion throughout the day. And let's be honest, social impact, all, it all starts with us in this room, the decision makers of the built environment. We have to push for social impact. We have to demand it and we have to plan for it in all the processes throughout a project. Otherwise, it is not gonna happen, unfortunately. Uh, today, I'm re representing Agitema and the knowledge that we have gathered uh, the recent years around uh, PP3s um, and addressing this subject of the conference today. We observe that it is most certainly a successful model to achieve social impact. I will share with you three, case, uh, three cases and point out uh, what have been the social impacts and most important, what actually made it possible to happen. Uh, very, very briefly, who am I? I'm an architect. I've worked almost 30 years from Copenhagen uh, in, in Architema, which is a office, architectural office that was founded in the 60s. We are a Scandinavian architectural firm uh, placed with offices throughout Scandinavia. We do a big variety of different architectural uh, services, and I want to point out one. You can see it on the screen, uh, all the different areas that we are in. But in infrastructure, we are actually today uh, active here in Toronto. We are designing the new uh, Ontario line, two of the stations, and we're doing it together with good collaborators 
here in Toronto, the uh, Cycler Architects. So it's exciting to, um, to broaden our view and also look at uh, Toronto as uh, potential um, partners for developing ideas and thoughts. Okay, so the first um, case I want to um, show or I want to share to you is, um, yeah, is this master plan. It's not very usual to make master plans in PP3s, but this master plan uh, that we won uh, a couple of years ago was brought out in a tender process because there was a tremendous need for social impact. You probably have the same areas in, uh, in Canada as well, but in, in the 60s in Denmark, a lot of social housing areas were built very fast. Uh, and during the years, they have shown that they have, uh, that they, they have turned out very vulnerable. They have like uh, very high um, crime rates, they have high unemployment rates, low income, and low level of education. So, and a lot of things has, has been done in terms to um, yeah, deal with those issues. But recently, uh, a few years ago, the Danish government decided that then the most difficult areas needed great transformations. So they have put upon the municipality and the social housing um, organizations in a certain area to make a transformation where the most vital key for that is to bring the, the amount of social housing units from 100% to 40%. That leaves 60% of the building space to invite private investors, private pension funds, to get them into the area and develop prices, private housings. It's, uh, it's, this uh, situation calls for very radical changes in both social structures and physical structures in this area. And that was the master plan that, uh, that Agitima won. And uh, so they were very clear to find this uh, social uh, impact that the client was looking for. And one of, the, one of the, um, the things we suggested to answer to these questions was uh, to make to emphasize local visibility since the very beginning of the carrying out of the master plan. These processes are so long and it's so, such great uh, or huge transformations to the area and to the citizens that live there that you kind of have to take them in to join the journey. So we, pro we proposed a community center as the very first initiative to be kicked up even when, when we were still planning, even when we were still doing the zoning plan and the tender process and you know it's very long uh, stakes. But to uh, engage the residents, to give them a, a little um, taste of what could they expect in the future, to start a positive thinking of the area. And this community center of is of course going to house social ac activities and initiatives. There's also going to be municipality workers being there. So it's a place for sharing a communi communication about this new great future for the area. We also suggested very early in the beginning to upgrade some urban spaces around the whole plan. Again, to do something visible, it would be easy, inexpensive upgrades, but again, to show the residents that you are part of the transformation, things are actually happening. And then this thing about reducing the social housings to 40%, bringing in private housing in terms of townhouses, uh, standalone houses, duplex houses, apartments, but for private rent, ensures a very diverse um, group of people. And that is, of course, what will bring the so social sustainability to a new level. It was also important that we suggested to look at how does this connect, how does this area connect to the surrounding cities? Because what we see in Denmark is that they they become these islands until now. Uh, people from the city never enter these housing areas and the, the other way around. So also in the beginning phase, we have to work with transit connections to the surroundings to begin to sew this area together with the existing um, uh, city. It was interesting that in the tender process, uh, it was not just the municipality. They teamed up and created a land development organization together with the social, the social company, uh, social housing company, and they asked the PPP team to join in with a private investor. 
Um, so we had to come up and find the private investor that we thought could lift this, uh, this uh, huge project, but also be interested in working towards social impact. Um, and another thing that was actually quite uh, different from this uh, collaboration phase was that the, from the tender's point of view, they had planned it as a, a process where, where the tender teams, they just met up and they had one way, they did presentations of their thoughts. But we really needed to have a dialogue with the client, with the municipality, with the social housing company, with the residents in order to come up with innovation, innovative ideas in order to, to answer the questions they were asking for the social impact. So we, we asked for more dialogue and the client actually changed the whole process for the tender process, allowed workshops where we could meet with the client and we went on site visits and together we, we got this shared understanding of what is actually the success uh, they're, they're looking for. That was a very positive thing. Third case is a, a new psychiatric hospital in one of Denmark's major cities, Aarhus. The client had just finished the somatic hospital, a huge hospital, and we're now facing the last um, piece, 7,000 square, uh, 7, uh, square meters of psychiatric hospital. We won it in 2014, it was a PPP uh, tender process, and today the client has measured, so what was the social impact? What came out of this? And it is very remarkable, since they had the old building, they could compare uh, worker satisfaction, and the new building showed really much higher worker satisfaction, much less stress among the staff. When there's less stress among the staff, there's less stress among the patients. So that reduced uh, drug uh, for the patients and also interventions. So that was really, really, really a very positive outcome that impacts the whole society in terms of economic cost and also down to the very uh, health, um, health or health, mental health uh, for the person. So, of course, this project has uh, gained a lot of attention. Uh, it's also received uh, awards and is being taken out as an example piece for modern healthcare. Uh, at, so, what, what happened during that process? Why, are we, why have we succeeded with such a, yeah, an, a meaningful place? Um, the client focused very much in the tender process on bringing in the users. They had not did that in the somatic hospital and they were unhappy with a lot of the solutions. So the tender actually called for a very clear and very thorough uh, user anticipation process. So we had to focus on that in our, in our apply in, in the tender process. And just a little uh, story that I love is that in all public buildings in Denmark, you have to integrate art. We had connected a very famous artist to the project and in these user dialogues, it came to his ear that the patients are actually doing their own artworks in the process of healing. And he, uh, he grabbed that idea and he integrated the, uh, the patient's artist into his own uh, art piece. So the picture you see here is actually the welcoming foyer where people come in. And, and when you see all these different expressions from normal people, uh, trying to get better, it just gives you a very warm and welcoming feeling. It's not intimidating and it takes this clinical um, feeling out of the building. Yeah, and in the PPP contract, um, these requirements were very, very clear. And there was one requirement that I really love. It was maximized present of the architects. Often we experience that when the de development is done, the architect is kind of set aside doing all the drawings and then the contractor is just doing the dialogue with whoever. Uh, but actually the architect has, is maybe the only one in the PPP team that, that has this holistic take on the whole thing from the detail to the vision that was, was one, uh, once born. 
So the architect had to attend all the meetings with the clients and could, could continue the dialogue throughout the whole process. We also had to define how we would uh, engage the users. And so together with the contractor, we, um, we proposed this model about green, yellow, red. So together with him, not to make him too nervous, oh, what about all these users? Are they gonna tear everything apart? We said, okay, there's some red areas, technical areas, shafts, bearing walls, all that stuff that cannot be touched. Then we have yellow areas. We can maybe try and see if we can do some changes here. And then there are the green areas that are the most interesting ones because that's actually where the user can have a big influence. So, and it was mainly in those areas that was, a, that was about um, their workflow, relations between functions, relation between patient and staff. That was really where we worked with the users. And it was also a very positive project or process for the users because then they could say, hey, this is where we can actually make a difference. So let's spend our energy in this zone. And what actually is now leading to this greater um, worker satisfaction, less use of drug and suspension, is what happens in these areas where the patients and the staffs have interactions and where the design really support um, what is needed there. A very important thing we've learned <laughs> is in the RFP evaluation. Often quality has a very low percentage of the evaluation and economy has maybe 75. If you really want social impact, you have to know that all the things that we often have to, um, to um, apply or to say are within the quality category. That's about how do we design the user process? Uh, how is the collaboration teams and stuff like that? And that's really where you, where you have to focus if you wanna have social impact. And if that has a very low score, then no matter how good you are there, you cannot compete with the lowest price. So the, the PPPs that actually acknowledge that and say maybe it's 50-50 or it's 60-40, then it really allows the quality um, that will lead to social impact to be taken much more serious. Yeah, the last project is an office house, a rather big office house, it was done in a PPP and we wanted, yeah, <clears throat> four years ago. Um, it's not so much that it's a beautiful office house, but it's what this beautiful office house does to the neighborhood. It's uh, built now in Aarhus, and it's actually built in kind of the same context or context as the first that I told you about, Volsmose, a social housing area that's on the ghetto list, as we call it in Denmark, and it is in full um, process of being transformed. Um, like I said before, reducing social housing, getting in private uh, building opportunities. So in that process, uh, the municipality in Aarhus, they made a very, very bold decision. They said, okay, we wanna be first movers. We wanna show that we actually believe that we can turn this area, which had a very, very bad reputation, but we can actually turn it around by, um, by using this building as an investment accelerator uh, to help redeveloping this challenging district. So uh, what they did is actually that um, it's not just an office house, but the whole ground floor is a community center. And it's quite big, uh, and it hosts a lot of people working there. And actually the people working there comes from the city, at least in the beginning, hopefully it will also come from the district. But it, people that had never been to Gellerup, that had no business there, that kept their way, now they have to go to work there every day. So it's very, very interesting, and the way it's done is that it's actually working very well. Um, it was very important to the municipality to find out, so how can this building uh, create social impact for the community? They didn't know, so they asked us, the PPP team, and uh, we were thinking, okay, we have to engage with the residents, the people that live out there, 
what are their dreams, what are their hopes, what are their challenges about being part of this whole transformation. So we added a specialist on the PVP team. Uh, I don't know the word for it. Um, city space strategic specialist. Somebody that really has a lot of experience about going out talking to people and trying to, to, uh, yeah, to get it into uh, to a new context. And, uh, and she was going out there uh, and find, ex found out that actually a lot of young people in the area would like to start their own business. They saw some needs, they had some ideas, but they could not rent. They could not afford uh, rent a commercial space in the area. So she brought that back to the PVP team. And uh, in the program, there was 1,500 square meters left of no po uh, free of program. It was up to us to suggest something. So we suggested uh, affordable space for startups. Uh, seeing that the people from the area, the residents, they will go in, they will create businesses, they will create meaning for themselves in this community center together with all the workers uh, from the municipality. And that also means that since they are now active in the house, there's a social active acceptance of this building. There's no vandalism, for example, which we feared. Uh, so now there's, uh, they, they're running the restaurant, the coffee shop, there's even a coffee roastery inside the building. There are um, maker space and workshops and uh, other kinds of things that has an outwarded function. So what can we learn from that? Uh, it was very important in the tender process that they have actually left that blank for us to be innovative about, to, for the PPP team to come with their suggestion on how can this building click into the context and actually lift something. Some of the other teams had diff totally different ideas. Uh, some team came up with sports uh, uh, activities. That should be the thing that would uh, connect people. But the client really liked this idea with the startups, helping people, creating their own businesses. And that was one of the reasons why we won it. Yes, that was the three cases. And just uh, very briefly here at the end, the, the learning points. Um, the project's own PPP team belongs to society. So social impact actually starts here. We are social hu human beings. So if we can just have place in the pro process, we can definitely affect it. The end user can experience the social impact of the projects before its completion. Uh, that's a really, really good way to engage the society. And then this thing, uh, the tender stage, that social impact hidden in this quality thing, it has to be lifted up in the evaluation presented um, when the final decisions are made for a team. Um, collaboration processes make room for innovation deliveries in order to uh, achieve social impact. So that's also a very good learning from our side. And then we must also remember that it's, it, it is how the PP3 model is impl implemented. Um, it's not the model alone that creates social impact. Yeah, and the last one, uh, it's important to create processes, design the processes that achieves uh, defining the goals for um, social impact. The last slide is, uh, I myself are here in Toronto for the rest of the week, but also Laura Gosmino, my good partner, and uh, helping me in, in getting all these achievements, to, all, all these experiences together for you today. We are also here for the rest of the week if there's something you want to address us to, but otherwise we look forward to having discussions with you uh, throughout the day. Thank you very much. But
Well, thank you, Dorothy, for that uh, presentation, your presentation. Uh, very compelling, and it brings some compelling ideas and examples to the table for today's uh, further discussion and our gathering here today. Um, uh, Ms. Kais will be available to all of you uh, through the rest of the day, especially at the networking break, which is coming up very shortly. Now, before that, we have a panel discussion. Obviously, we have some chairs set up here, and we have a panel discussion focused on P3s and trust. And um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Uh, we'll start with Sherry Brandt, who is right here, a partner and international leader of Indigenous law with Bordner, Borden Ladner Gervais. We have also uh, Lisa Mitchell, president and CEO of the Canadian Council for Public-Private Partnerships. And uh, we have uh, Maddie Simiatiki, Director of the Infrastructure Institute and Professor with the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto. And uh, last but not least, we have Adam Marsala, the Director of Corporate Affairs and External Affairs with Novo Nordisk Canada. So uh, let's go grab a seat and then let's go on some discussion. So, uh, uh, Maddie, speaking earlier about some of these matters, you uh, mentioned the P3 model of today doesn't necessarily uh, engender trust. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Sure. Thanks, Ian. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, when I think of public-private partnerships here in Canada, what first comes to mind is uh, the, the traditional in approach in the infrastructure sector of design, build, finance, operate, maintain. And this approach to public-private partnership has spread right across the country. There have now been over 200 of these projects with a capital value of over $100 billion. So this is a massive amount of spending and we've essentially rebuilt much of our infrastructure in this country, our big infrastructure, through public-private partnerships. Now, what we found over the last number of years is that while we call this approach to delivering infrastructure a partnership, essentially what it is is a public-private contract. That the, the counterparties are in much more of a contractual relationship with each other than a deep, meaningful partnership where they pull together. And the, and the saying is, transfer the risk to the party best able to manage it not necessarily share the risk meaningfully between equal partners who will work together to resolve problems uh, collaboratively. And we've seen the impacts of this approach, of this notion of, uh, of a partnership that really is a contract. We've seen lawsuits right across the country. In fact, here in, on, on the Eglinton Crosstown, uh, we've seen a number of lawsuits. Uh, we've seen them on tunnel projects. We've seen them on all different types of projects as the relationships have frayed when projects go wrong. And uh, we don't even have to talk about the Ottawa LRT, which has just been uh, mired in all sorts of challenges right from the get-go. But I think even though there are challenges with the way we've done public-private partnerships to date, this isn't to throw the baby out with the bathwater. In fact, the problems we face today are so big that no sector alone is going to solve them. And if anything, what we need to do is breathe new life into the true notion and the true definition of the word partnership and collaboration between sectors and not think of it as a transactional, uh, a transactional relationship, but something that's much more deeply rooted in collaboration, shared interest, and collective problem solving. How do we do that, Eddie? Part of it is the deal structures, that the structures right now are really set up to, to be transactional and in some cases even adversarial, where each partner tries to maximize their own benefit uh, and then work through the contract when things go wrong to resolve those issues. But what we've actually seen is in Canada is there are examples of much more deep meaningful partnerships uh, of collaboration. There's a project just around the corner from here in Toronto called the Red Door Shelter, which is a phenomenal example of a project where there was an old uh, church building which was running a shelter out of it. And when the, build, when the church congregation decided to sell the building, the developer who bought the building couldn't quite figure out what to do with it. Uh, and when the, when the developer came in for a tour of the building, they went through with the shelter operator and decided, we can't evict them. This is such an important use in our community. And instead, they, what they did is they worked meaningfully to try to find a way for the shelter to stay 
in the building alongside an upscale condominium. Now this also required the city to come on board and that posed its own set of challenges. How does a city then procure a shelter and set up a relationship with a private sector operator? And what they've ended up with is this phenomenal building with beautiful architecture that has a fairly upscale condominium with a homeless shelter built into the side of it. And what's really important here is often you hear about this idea of the poor doors, that in these partnerships, the private sector gets the most valuable plots and the public, and the public or the nonprofit use gets uh, some type of uh, the leftovers. And what happened in this case was such a clear collaboration where both parties were able to get the part of the building and the deal structure that made it work for them. And those are the types of deep, meaningful partnerships between the public, private, and nonprofit sector that I think we really need when we're reinvigorating this idea of partnership. Lisa, from your perspective, um, what are some of the issues with how the public perceives uh, P3s? Yeah, thanks for the question, and it's interesting following Matthew <laughs> with his comments. There's some, some things we agree on and some that, you know, we might have differences of opinions, but I mean, I think public perception, I think generally I'd argue the public doesn't really actually perceive much about P3s. Um, I'm an Ottawa resident. Generally, when you talk about the LRT, unless they know what I do for a living, the procurement model is not what they're talking about. Um, these are Canadians who expect their kids to be able to go to school, to have access to hospitals and healthcare, highways and public transit that works. That's really where the trust is. Um, you know, I think Canada is a recognized global leader in P3s. We have, you know, the numbers are debatable depending on how many, what models you put under the umbrella, but you know, two, between two and 300 um, across the country. And um, I'd argue that largely there's a bunch of people in this room that are using P3s or accessing P3s and you might not even know they're P3s because we tend to only talk about them uh, when they go wrong. Um, you know, Maddie touched on it too, the P3 started as a way to deliver large and complex projects in a way that was going to be a bit more efficient, a bit more cost effective. Dealing with large complex projects and cost overruns and time delays, that there was a view that maybe we could do this better, we could do this differently. And that's really where, where, it, where it came from. Um, but I do find it interesting that the public perception, I think, sometimes is driven in what you read. Um, very rarely do you pick up a paper when a traditional project has gone wrong and go, ah, it was a design bid build. That was the problem. Uh, but when a P3 goes wrong, especially the big ones, especially the notable ones, people often point fingers at, at the model. And rightly or wrongly, um, not everything uh, is necessarily about the implementation of the model. These are large and complex projects. Things are going to go wrong. And I think that narrative that's sometimes missing is how the model, in some cases, can protect taxpayers. Uh, and that sometimes gets buried in, buried in the lead in some of these projects as well, too. I think the other thing on public perception is really that there's vocal opponents in this country. Uh, vocal opponents that are quick to mobilize, they have money behind them, and so when things go wrong, they're very quickly able to launch campaigns. They've implemented referendums across the country, they have put advertisements out, they've published documentation, um, and so when, you, when things go awry, sometimes they're the first people that have quotes in, the, in, you know, in, in some of the articles that are out there. Um, so I think there's, it's twofold. I think it's, you know, the model itself is complicated. Um, I'm probably the least entertaining dinner guest when people ask what I do for a living. Uh, a lot of glassy <laughs> eyes. Um, but I think it's twofold. I think it's, there's, you know, we, we only point to it when there's problems, and I think that there's a lot of people out there that are delivering a lot of misinformation about what they are and how they work. So what's the strategy to deal with these uh, challenges? Well, we need to get louder, I think, as an industry. Uh, we need to be able to be out there. We need evidence. We need data. We need to be able to sort of say to folks that, okay, there are issues in these areas. Here's what's happened. But here's where things are working. You know, as Maddie said, 200 plus projects across, you know, across the country. We have water, wastewater treatment facilities, biosolids, energy from waste, schools, and nobody's talking about them because they're doing just exactly what they're supposed to do. So how do we gather the data and the evidence and the stories that sort of promote the work that we're doing um, and be a bit more vocal about, about uh, what we do as an industry and how we're helping to support not just delivering big, large, complex pu public infrastructure, but the services that Canadians rely on. How do you go about getting louder and getting that message out? Well, that's some of the stuff that we're focused on at the Council. We represent both the public sector owners and private sector uh, members, who, sort of all facets of, of the delivery spectrum. Um, and so I think you know, some of the initiatives that we're, we're looking on are, are how do we get at that data and the research? How do we open the kimono a little bit to be a bit more transparent uh, to Canadians about, about what we do? So that's a lot of what we're working on right now. And uh, before we move on, for individual 
proponents or p folks who are doing P3s, how do they get their message out? How do they get louder and get into that debate? Well, I think there's a, it's a big community, right? I mean, I think just demonstrated by the people in this room and the people that you've got online, there's a lot of people that are very interested. There's a lot of people that are involved in the, in the delivery. Um, I think we're sometimes very quick to react to the problems that we need to get a little bit better at singing our own praises um, and getting the good news stories, stories out there. Sherry, your work focuses on partnerships between the private sector and indigenous communities, particularly in energy. I was wondering about your views on how indigenous communities are approached or consulted on these projects. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me, Ian. Uh, it's interesting when we're talking about the topic here of trust and, and your statements there, Maddie. I mean, trust presumes that there is a relationship between two parties. Um, and often, you know, the work that I've been involved in, there was no relationship. We had to create the relationship. Um, and so I've been very active in the, in the energy space looking to create that relationship and uh, see how, how we could create uh, partnerships among industry and First Nations. But I would say the way it really started, if we're thinking about how our Indigenous groups approached and consulted, there was really, um, you know, in the early days, sort of thinking back to some of the earlier cases in 2004 was a Haida case. And that was the early days of consultation. And it was really all about trying to bring attention to the indigenous issues, to the indigenous rights. Um, and that was quite complicated. And so we really ended up having to resort to uh, focusing on procurement and policy initiatives. And uh, you know, it's really not until you look to 2015 when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came out, came out when um, First Nations started to be more actively involved in partnerships that we start to see different forms of partnerships that have created meaningful outcomes. Um, so we've started to see First Nations move towards looking for a model that is meaningful to them. And it's not, um, it's, uh, it, has, it has ended up focusing on the equity side, right? Thinking about how you can bring in First Nations and Indigenous groups into commercial projects has been often the work that we've been focused on. Is there any other example of a better approach you can think of? So, you know, in thinking about a better approach, it would be, you know, from my perspective, uh, better, better is not always necessarily the right word. What we were looking for is how do we break down barriers? What is an approach that facilitates and breaks down barriers for indigenous participation? What is an approach that enables a First Nation or an indigenous group to invest in a project um, is, is what we end up thinking about. And, and so we've ended up with some pretty interesting structures, um, thinking to um, procurement involving indigenous groups. We ended up uh, with Hydro One when it was looking to, uh, well, to 2017 when Hydro One was looking to do its IPO, they very much had to come up with a structure and wanted First Nations involvement. Uh, in that structure, and so they ended up creating equity participation model for First Nations. We were able to structure that um, and bring 129 communities into a partnership. Is there any lesson from that process that you would suggest to those here or online in sort of going forward with these kinds of projects? Well, I think from the Indigenous perspective, there, there's always an interest to what will be the meaningful participation for those communities. I don't think there's any one uh, model per se, but it's how do you bring how do you bring communities into the projects? How do you enable communities to participate? Whether it's from um, an economic perspective, from like is it revenue sharing? Is the partnership about revenue sharing? Is it about creating more jobs and employment and opportunities? <laughs> and the communities are often just looking for a chance to create their own local economies, right? Okay. Adam, uh, part of the process of, of gathering here today has been, a, it's been a bit of an education on P3s in the health sector. I mean, we think of P3s in terms of buildings, LRTs, and airports, and hospitals, and other things. But I wonder if you, you, you have an experience with P3s more in healthcare. I wonder if you could tell us about that. Thanks, Ian. I, I think the, the irony is that we had a number of years of gaining experience in P3s without actually knowing that we were involved in P3s. And I think that speaks to some of what, what Maddie discussed earlier. I think the conventional model sometimes, at least in an average person's head, has a bit of baggage associated with it, right? And you try and 
set that aside and move on. Uh, we're a biopharmaceutical company. We work in the healthcare space. So for us, the focus has been on chronic diseases, um, specifically how you reduce the burden of chronic diseases. That talks about things like disease prevention, built environment, some of the things that were shared by Dorothy earlier. So in our case, we got involved in this, I want to say, uh, within Canada, myself personally, about eight years ago, and it's been iterative. So from each of them that we've done, we've learned something that we try to incorporate into the next one. And I just want to emphasize the point of, you know, it's about more than enforcing a contract between partners. It really is about building trust, and that really resonates with what our experience has been with this, right? Like, over time, as you build trust and you adjust as you go, less important is the dollar value, and more important is what's the social output that you're getting, and what's that shared output that all the partners are looking for. And public trust, how is that? How does that? We've heard how it works in um, sort of bricks and mortar or P3s. How does it work in the healthcare sector? What have your experiences been? Uh, I think just showing up in a transparent way that where people put their cards on the table in terms of what they're hoping to achieve. I mean, in our case, it's very easy to talk about rates of chronic disease. When we look at rates of type 2 diabetes and obesity in Canada, it stands out even within the OECD. Like it's trending absolutely in the wrong direction. You think about impact on healthcare systems, impact on emergency rooms, impact on primary care. Where that's heading over the next 10 or 15 years is not a good place. So how do we back that up uh, in, a, in a meaningful way, talking about uh, engagement with community groups, built environment, foodscapes and food security, income inequality, all those social determinants of health, how does that wrap around uh, a model that can bring more people into the discussion that otherwise wouldn't have seen themselves as part or their organizations mm -hmm. as part of a public health dialogue? Is there any way to sort of embed some of the um, consultation and collaboration you do in your P3s into the other P3s we've heard of here? Yeah, it, it's a really good question and I don't know. I've mm -hmm. never been in a non-health related P3, but I think it's already been talked about a couple times uh, today. Uh, having trust, having candor, um, and, and, and building trusted relationships over time. Like we all live in the same society, whether we sit in the public sector, private sector, academia, we all live, work, play in the same communities. So start there. Uh, Maddie, I think you. Yeah, I wanted to pick up on uh, some of Adam's comments and some of what we've heard and, and Lisa's comments too. Uh, Lisa mentioned getting louder. I think we have to get better at doing public-private partnerships. I think what our communities are finding is that, uh, that these projects, when they look at them, that what they're finding is they're not living up to expectations. That in many cases, the public consultation surrounding public-private partnerships has not been very good, and communities feel uh, excluded. Uh, they then feel like the architecture and design of these buildings, because of the way the procurement has been structured and set up, is not, is not great. Uh, the projects themselves are inflexible, and so we have examples in Alberta where uh, schools were delivered through public-private partnerships and they now can't be retrofitted to make, to make them into community hubs because of the way the contract is drafted. Uh, there was an example, at least reported in the CBC, uh, where they said the, the teachers couldn't even turn up the heat in the buildings because of the operating contract. I mean, that is not good infrastructure and that's not good for our communities. So I think we need to really be revisiting what it is to be in partnership. And, Yes, we need to be doing better research, but we also need to be designing these projects to fit the communities uh, that public-private partnerships are being built into. And we know we can do this because we have examples of them, like the Red Door Shelter, like the Indigenous Hub that's being built uh, in the Canary District just around the corner from here. There are many examples where we've shown uh, what a true partnership can be, but we have to start with first principles. The contract should be the last thing, and it should be guided by our values rather than the other way around. Go ahead. Yeah, just to pick up on one of the comments Maddie made, because you know the, the, that seems to be a common thread about sort of the inflexibility. But we have to remember these are long-term contracts, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 25, 30 years. So when you entered into a contract in, in you know in year one to design a school, if 15 years later they want to do something different with the asset, that wasn't necessarily considered. So you, you, we can take those lessons learned and adapt. But I'm not sure that it's exactly fair that to sort of say, well, they've changed. They've sort of changed the nature of the game. Uh, so I think we need to take that into, consi into consideration. I do think that there's lots of examples, though, that nobody's talking about, where those partnership aspects are actually happening, where it lives outside of the contractual obligations. We just went through a pandemic. We had projects that were under construction, where workers couldn't, you know, up in the Northern Territories, where workers were from the South, they needed some place to quarantine uh, before they could go to work. 
people partnered together, governments and private sector, to find solutions. We had people that were looking for supplies. Down in the you know, supply chain was a problem. So there was the ability. Um, I think there are examples. Maddie's not wrong. I think there are examples where sometimes it's become, and we get accused of this often, is becoming too litigious. Um, and I think that's a challenge that we have and a challenge I've put out. You know, We had a long conversation about this at our conference in November out to the industry, like put the P back into partnership. But I would say that it's not fair to give the impression that it's absent because that's not the case. I think you know, there are some, maybe some cases, rightly or wrongly, and I've had conversations about schools in Alberta and that heat situation, and there's two sides of every story. Um, but I do think that you know, we, we need to focus on where it is working, harness those lessons learned, and if we need to adapt in places, then we really need to be able to do that. Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to add in. So in the indigenous context, the engagement is built mm -hmm. into the process because the communities are rights holders, and so there's already those protocols and processes that are built in. The idea is what is the outcome? And is the outcome based on an impact that is perceived or in fact studied based on technical studies? Or is the impact something that we want to look towards more of a social impact perspective? Do we want to perceive an impact on the basis of a reconciliation type outcome? And so that's kind of where the trends are moving now. We initially were doing projects based on impact. And then there was lots of discussions around whether, the, whether companies or, in, or indigenous groups have veto rights. We're sort of seeing a movement away from that and saying, you know what, we actually just want to partner with the communities that are in our neighborhood because it makes sense, within the communities that are in our region because we know that we're going to have better outcomes, yeah. better jobs, and, and a better Canada. Um, but so that's kind of a little bit of the trending. Adam, you look like you have something to say. No, I just, I, I, I want to at least talk for a second because I think it ties to that, Jerry. Like, we've been running a program globally called Cities Changing Diabetes for nearly a decade now. And one of the learnings coming out of there are some fantastic and tangible examples of delivering a social benefit in a community. For example, uh, one of the suburbs of Copenhagen, I always bring it back to Denmark for every talk, um, there's a suburb of Copenhagen that showed a 10% reduction in childhood overweight and obesity, but the asterisk beside that is that it took them about 12 years to get there with a whole bunch of community programming, all kinds of partners involved, um, you know, everything from food provided in schools to how they were engaging with public health nurses. Those who are interested, you can punch that into your Google search engine. That's my shameless plug, and you can see there the example. But in addition to it taking 12 years, we haven't found an easy way to scale that. So that works nicely in a suburb of Copenhagen. I have no idea if it works in Mississauga. We're going to find out. Um, you've referenced Be Better, put the P back in partnership among your comments. Um, for folks here who are in projects, leaving here today, and this isn't the last question, but it may sound like it, leaving here today, how do they do that tomorrow and in the days ahead? To anyone who wants to take the question. Uh, for me, I think we need to start with that idea of partnership and collaboration. There are new, mo and it really, this sounds cheesy, but it starts with people. I mean, there are new models that are out there that are uh, called an alliance model, where instead of having two counterparties to a partnership, they actually create something closer to a joint uh, company, uh, and they work much more closely uh, together from the outset to co-create the solution to the problem together. And in some of these cases, they're actually doing like psychometric tests on each other to see how they're going to work together. Because often what you find in construction, and Lisa's right about this, this is an area where these are very complex projects where things will go wrong. And some of the question is, how will different individuals respond yeah. when, they're, when, when their feet are to the fire and when their company or their organization or even them personally uh, are facing risks? How, will they become litigious or will they try to work collaboratively uh, to solve those problems together? And I think uh, it'll be interesting to see if an industry that has been based around generally an adversarial set of relationships can now transform itself to become truly collaborative in the true sense of, of the concept of partnership. And we'll see, there are actually a couple of examples now here in, Tor in Toronto and in Canada. Uh, there's a hospital project that's being worked on in British Columbia, uh, and part of the Union Station uh, redevelopment here in, in uh, downtown Toronto is being done through this alliance model. So we're going to see, but I think ultimately this does really start and end with the individuals at the table and trying to come up with uh, true meaningful solutions as problems invariably do arise. Psychometric tests, is that something that is <laughs> like available to folks? That's something that they could, is that a thing? Or? I mean, they're essentially doing like those Briggs-Myers tests on each other to see yeah. how they're going to respond and whether their personalities 
fit. That's what I mean. And, and you're starting to see that playing out in certain corners of the industry, and that may send a bit of a shiver down your spine until you're negotiating again across the table from someone. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they have a completely different uh, approach to resolving conflict than you, and that approach tends to be much more adversarial than the one that you would like, uh, that, could be, that could ultimately be uh, both problematic from a relationship perspective and also extremely expensive uh, depending on the circumstances that arise. Lisa, do you, uh, sorry, no, you, you... Sure, thanks. I mean, I mentioned an earlier Hydro One example, but that, and I, I, if we were to categorize, I would say that was really more based on a reconciliation type initiative. It was policy-based. Uh, but Hydro One, I sit on the board, I've sat on the board mm -hmm. since 2018. It very much has projects that have to be built on time and on budget and, and, has inherent, and have inherent risk. Mm -hmm. And from their perspective, what they've come about in terms of building a better project is why don't we eliminate this earlier process of, you know, what do you think is the impact? Do I agree with you? Do I disagree? Why don't we eliminate that and sort of take away the brinksmanship and say, look, we're going to do this together. Let's make it a 50-50 partnership. We recognize that transmission lines have impacts. Uh, let's focus on a 50-50 partnership at the outset so that we don't spend all this time negotiating whether your partnership should be 5% based on impact or 15%. We've eliminated that. And, uh, you know, the view is that that's really going to engender trust. That will build a relationship. We don't accept that that is what, like, you can't just say, okay, I'm going to do that and now I've done my work and, you know, are we done? It, like, it's, it's always going to be, I think some of the other speakers spoke about this too. The work is in the person work. The work is in that actual direct contact. The work is in the relationships that are being made. The outcomes are in you know, seeing a community progress, seeing people get into high school, get into trades, get into other jobs. Uh, you know, the goal is seeing access to capital and having those communities be able to look to partnering projects or developing projects on their own. I mean, that's, we're sort of gone from a place in 2003 where there was no participation, no case law. Now 2004, you know, we've got this early case law. And we've been sorting it all out through all these different years. I don't necessarily think we need to get rid of, I, I wouldn't necessarily like to get rid of that because it is our common law case law reasoning. But if you move to a reconciliation based model, you can be assured there will be all sorts of other collateral benefits. Um, I'd like to leave some time. Oh. Lisa, you yeah, like. Just, just to jump in on the, the original question about what people here who are working on projects, what can they do and think about? I mean, some of that work is already happening. At the council, we have the benefit of having both parties at the table. Um, and those conversations are happening. We have a 30-year history in this country. And I would argue that the, if you go back and look at some of the early projects that we did in the, the mid to late 90s, they're not the same as the ones that you're seeing mm -hmm. in the market today. Yeah. We have a history of evolving and adapting and harnessing lessons learned and developing leading practices. And so that work is underway. I think it goes to Maddie's point at the outset about not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, I, you know, we might have differences of opinion sometimes in terms of what might work or not. Nobody is saying that this is sort of perfect. Uh, we can always learn and, and adapt. And so that work is actually ongoing. It's very much a thread of what's, uh, what happens in the council's events. Top opportunities for P3s in Canada, Lisa, so what do you think? Top opportunities? Yeah. I mean, look, we're always going to need sort of basic infrastructure. We're a large country. We always need to move goods and services. So, we, you know, transportation is always going to be a thing. We're, healthcare is big right now. You know, transit's a tricky space. That's, you know, I'm not telling tales out of school on that one. Um, Why no is matter it a tricky what space? City you're in. I, I think we, you know, I think we've seen projects that um, have had challenges adapting to the model. They're long, they're linear projects, they're complex, they involve tunnels. It's, you know, I think we, you, you, as an industry, looking at sort of applying the design, build, finance, operate, maintain, and then taking into consideration extensions in some cities, it became a bit more complicated than I think than any of us maybe originally thought. Doesn't mean that we're saying not our space, it's just, okay, maybe we need to take the lessons learned, we need to read the auto LRT and sort of think about that. But we're also looking at, at new areas too. Um, how do we sort of apply P3 principles in energy, in broadband? Uh, where there's other other needs, but sort of that basic, you know, schools and things. It, that, that's that's not going away. Adam, I think also like it's it, it, it's acknowledging something that I think you just touched on, which is the toolkit that we had for the problems of 30 years ago 
doesn't match the kind of problems that we're trying to solve now. That's it. So playing on these bigger teams that cut across sectors, cut across organizations, that's where I think there's the potential to do great things here. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, I, I agree, it's people and it's trust between those people and those parties. That's yeah. the piece where that takes time to build and you don't just you know, write a procedure mm -hmm. to get that. You have to have repeated dialogue uh, over a long period of time. How do folks here play on those bigger teams? Yeah, that's the question. Okay. I was just going to sure. jump in and add in, I'm not sh I don't know, maybe others do, but have we really seen First Nations, Indigenous groups formally involved in P3 projects, right? I mean, it's something to table, something to think about, uh, because the whole concept is around social impact, yeah. around building, building, building better projects. Yeah. So. And, and we have, and I think it, there's more to do. Yeah, and I, I mean, to me, I also see the system probably in my view, maybe getting more complicated because you're going to have large companies who will, through um, different doctrines like the uh, United Na Nations Declaration on Indigenous Rights, different corporations are now taking their own policy mm -hmm. steps and yeah. implementing those and will want to see their Indigenous partners in those contracts. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was going to just um, echo one of... Uh, uh, Lisa's comments, which is that we have seen a lot of evolution in this country in terms of how we've done P3s. I think in general, uh, it's been evolution for the better. And I think the key for all of us is not to become ideological any which way about these projects. That's when we've gotten into trouble. I mean, in the mid 2000s, we had rules on the books that said essentially, if you are doing a project over a certain uh, monetary value, you had to first screen out P3, rather than evaluate every project equally on its, every procurement model equally on its merits. And I think that forced a lot of projects down a route that maybe wasn't best for them. And I think where Lisa's absolutely right is where we've been innovative is we've enabled uh, parts of the projects that have not worked, some of the really punishing long-term contracts. We've gotten rid of those. We don't transfer uh, uh, revenue risk very much anymore. I think that was very positive. Our, our counterparts who have done that elsewhere have really struggled with their projects. So I think there's lots of ways that we can be evolving and continue to evolve, uh, but it requires us not to be ideological or wedded to one approach to project delivery or another, but see them as tools in a toolbox that will each work in different contexts. I'm going to roll the dice and assume that there are questions from the floor and the <laughs> moments we have left. Maybe there are no questions. No, their hands have gone up, so I know members of our team will enable... Uh, why don't you go over there, Matt? You can first. Do I need a um, my name is Jessica Shadian. I'm the president and CEO of Arctic 360. First, I just want to say thank you all for this conversation. I'd be, I'd be a fan of sitting at your dinner table because of the things I love to talk about myself. <laughs> um, so Arctic 360 is Canada's basically um, think tank to elevate the national conversation about the North um, and a big focus on kind of the origins of where uh, Arctic 360 came from was talking about how do we bring private capital north to build big you know, transportation, energy, fiber uh, infrastructure that we need there. And we talked a lot about it in terms of public-private indigenous partnerships. Um, and one thing that we've learned is that uh, from the institutional investor space, the most important thing is, one of the most important things is a strategy. Um, there's, we need some, some sort of strategy for the north that would help understand them if there's you know pipelines of projects, how to bundle projects, etc. Um, and so my question for everyone is right now the CIB, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, is going through their five-year review process. And I'm um, I'm wondering maybe if someone some of you would like to comment on what role the CIB has to play in these discussions and some of the challenges and maybe areas that we should be going towards. Um, and whether or not a strategy, you know, infrastructure strategies or a strategy has a role to play, um, whether it's from infrastructure or from CIB, um, in, in the whole P3 process. Sure. Ian, I can speak about it for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, you know, it's really important in terms of uh, understanding what the role of the CIB would be in this. Uh, I would say what comes to mind immediately and what we've understood from working with the CIB is it's really all centered around access to capital. How can we enable Indigenous communities to have access to capital? Um, as well as how can, how can those projects address major infrastructure gaps? 
And so when you look at the issue and you look at the problem, you're really immediately presented with the Indian Act and all of its limitations and barriers and constraints. And I think what the CIB has done, and we've been fortunate to work alongside them uh, and assist on the Indigenous Community Infrastructure Initiative projects, is really take a look and say, like, this infrastructure is integral to the community, it's meaningful to, to the community, how are we going to get this done, right? And how do we bring the right parties together that will bring the capital and recognize that these are Indigenous-sponsored projects, that it's the community that wants it. And so the question will then become, like, how do we balance, you know, those restrictions and navigate through those processes? And so obviously there's a lot of planning that has to happen, but if there's a will and there's access to capital that can provide the way, it takes you miles and miles ahead of, of uh, what uh, other processes that we've had to go through. Go ahead, I think this, the strategy part of what your question I think is, is really key because the bank is a tool and Maddie made that comment as well too. There's tools in the toolbox and you know, and so looking at every project through the same lens isn't, isn't gonna work. And that's why I think things like what Infrastructure Canada and, and the government of Canada had started with the National Infrastructure Assessment uh, is really important because I think looking at the needs across Canada, uh, no matter where they are ge geographically, what type of asset, but understanding them through a systems and networks process, I think is really part of the, the, the challenge that we have. So I'm not sure that we always have a full understanding of what the needs are and how they interconnect. Um, any other questions? I'm, there, you, sir, there in the... Yes, my name's Blake Stewart. I'm uh, retired. I'm uh, part of uh, Joe uh, Public. And I'm interested in this topic because of the, the industry that I, I worked for with construction materials for 23 years. But I was interested to hear from Lisa. I'm, I'm intrigued about learning more about the council. And, and you talked about lessons learned. And, and it sounds like there are a lot of well-kept secrets about the success of uh, uh, public-private uh, partnerships. So I'm, I'm curious about how, how do you plan to educate the broader public about what these projects are about. I can think of, uh, you know, 407 ETR. I can think of a uh, hospital in Brampton. I've lived there for 25 years. There's a lot of political hype about P3 at the beginning. And then who circles back and who, who tells us what the, what the public has gained from these arrangements, these financing arrangements? And how do we, how do we judge the success of P3 if there's no follow-up? It's always a political lens that these projects uh, end up being examined through, so there's a lot of emotion expressed, but it's how do we get those uh, evaluations of the money spent? Yeah, and I think those are the things that we're starting to, to, to think through. I mean, you know, to communicate to the public, public about an issue, um, sometimes you have to pick the right time. Uh, you know, you can send an op-ed into the papers talking about something that's important to you, but if it's not, you know, relevant to the news of the day or something that's going on in the community, it, you know, it's, it's, not going, it's not going to get published. So how do we tap into that at the right time, make our voices heard, provide the data and the evidence to folks to, to better understand? P3, just the concept of a P3 is very complicated. So how do you distill that into, into palatable, palatable information for the, for the general public? But I think there's also, you know, how do we communicate with with other public sector. There's obviously some public sector procurement agencies across Canada that this is the part of their everyday business and they're very well versed. But there's also a lot of folks that aren't, uh, a lot of communities that aren't using P3s, whether it be municipal or indigenous communities, smaller uh, provinces. How do we tap into them as well too and, and start to, to provide the learnings there as, as well? So I think, you know, we're also very, very focused in this country and have been for quite some time on um, getting shovels in the ground and the procurement and we haven't focused as much on the operations and maintenance of these assets and there's really good news stories in there that we need to kind of we need to draw them out a bit more especially as we watch our colleagues over in the UK um, who have a bit more of a mature portfolio of projects than us and are going through you know getting ready for the handback of these assets after their 20 25 30 year contracts and so what can we learn from there because I think that that value for money question that that Maddie raised which is really that comparative analysis of whether a p3 or a traditional model is the way to go you know how do we how do we proof out that concept at the end of life of these contracts so I think there's quite a bit that needs to be done but how we communicate depends on the audience we're trying to communicate to I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions um, uh, you, you sir in the back there you 
Well, thank you, everyone. My question is really for Maddie. I share your opinion that we need better, not necessarily louder. Um, you said instead of contract, let's go to values. And as far as the private sector is concerned, at least uh, for profit businesses, as a business lawyer, I can tell you with confidence the value is simple. It's all about maximize the shareholder benefit. Everything else is just, you know, expenses. So, do you agree that? Uh, we really need to focus on the government because when it gets to the government, the value is not easily defined. So if you want to really advocate for better, where would you focus your advocacy? On government or on the private sector that has a simple, not changeable value? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think, I think that's at, at the heart of this is that, uh, it, for, from my perspective, it's really the role of government to be setting out from their electorates what the values of their community are and what are to be prioritized. And then you establish a procurement model and a contract that allows you to follow through on that. And what we've seen in the way that we've done procurement uh, and public-private partnerships here is that even though they're scored 50-50 in terms of uh, design and architecture and all of those values and price, when you actually look at how the scoring gets done, the lowest price is what is really driving who's winning uh, the contracts. This is uh, for Infrastructure Ontario, and it, it has tended to play out nationally. And so what you end up with is projects that may meet uh, the, the baseline goals, but do not necessarily achieve all of the uh, community benefits that could be built into them, uh, uh, whether it's a community benefit agreement around labor, uh, or whether it's design and some of the art that we saw in the Danish model. I mean, go into some of the facilities here and try to look around for art and see what art and what types of design uh, is in our facilities. I think we're really undervaluing how much th uh, this public infrastructure serves as the cornerstones of our community, and we can breathe new life into that. Now, it doesn't mean that it has to be expensive. We don't necessarily need to be building monuments to ourselves, but we do need to be using intelligent uh, and uh, creative solutions to local problems, and then building them right into the types of business models that we're creating, recognizing that, as you said, the private sector's role uh, is to, to make money, but that can be harnessed towards meeting a shared interest with uh, the government and with the wider community. Folks, I think we're going to have to leave it at that. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank uh, 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 Sherry, Lisa, Adam, and Maddie for their insights today. And uh, next up is a 15-minute break. Uh, we'd like All to right. do that. Oh, a round of applause <laughs> for our panelists. We're just about to get started again, so let the last few people kind of settle in. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Manika raman Wilms. Uh, I'm the host of the Decibel podcast here at the Globe and Mail, uh, and I'm happy to be moderating the second half of today's event. Uh, for anyone who hasn't heard the Decibel, we're a daily news podcast. We publish every weekday morning, Monday to Friday, and we dive deep into a news story of the day. It's usually in about 20 minutes or less. Uh, and, and yeah, you should check it out if you haven't. Uh, today's podcast is about economic predictions and, uh, and why they're not as accurate as they used to be. So you can find that anywhere, uh, anywhere you find your podcasts. Uh, but back to the event of the day. I uh, hope you all enjoyed the break, got some food, ready to, to dive into the next, the next set of things. Uh, we're going to have a brief presentation first, and then we'll, after, after that, we'll have time for audience questions, uh, and we'll have a discussion there as well. So you'll, you'll get a chance to, to ask your questions again. Uh, but first, I'd like to introduce to the stage Jeffrey Sear, who's the managing partner of Raven Indigenous Capital Partners in Ottawa. Uh, for nearly 25 years, Jeff has provided strategic leadership for Indigenous, not-for-profit, and government organizations, and he now works in Indigenous social finance and the social innovation space. So, Jeff, welcome. The stage is yours. Thanks. I'm mic'd up, so I don't need this. Um, I think we have a presentation coming on screen, correct? Or I have the presentation, even better. Oops, let me go backwards. Well, no, I'll leave it there, that's fine. Um, so, Tanshi Aini Bonjo, Kinu Kinu Nene Indigenakas. My traditional name is Eagle Man Leading. I come from the White Horse Plains area of southern Manitoba, two Metis communities. My family had scrip along the Red River. Um, that's where my, most of my family lives today. Secondly, I'm a father of five adults now. Uh, so, I'm about to empty nest. That's a whole new thing, by the way. 
um, and a, a, a proud husband to Nicole. Um, in the daytime work, I am co-founder and managing partner of Raven Indigenous Capital Partners. You see the two logos, I'll do this really quickly. I've got 20 minutes of your time, fairly complicated subject matter, so I'm gonna kinda breeze through it and then we got a Q&A that we can work through. Raven Capital is an Indigenous-led and owned financial intermediary. I didn't know this five years ago. I'm now an Indigenous venture capitalist investor. We started with a $5 million fund, what we thought was $5 million. It ended up being 25. Two months ago, we closed the second fund, which we thought was $75 million. We actually raised 120, but peeled it back to 100 because we thought that's what we could responsibly deploy in a short period of time. So we're investing in Indigenous social enterprises across North America. Um, it's pretty interesting. It's not as interesting as the outcomes finance we're going to talk to you about today, in my opinion. At the same time, we started a sister charity so that we can work in doing research and design work inside the ecosystem. And the reason is because we want to create greater impact inside our communities. We want to peel back a couple hundred years of colonialism and essentially get better outcomes for our people. So my approach to finance, economics, markets, is they're all human constructions and we can change them and remake them to get better outcomes for our people everywhere. And they can and should be adapted. And I'm sure when these systems were created 400 years ago, part of the colonial experience, they didn't anticipate where we'd be today. And I'm gonna place public and private partnerships into that milieu. We don't call our work public-private partnerships, interestingly. You also heard this up in an earlier panel. What we're about is getting better outcomes. It turns out it looks nearly identical, though, at the end of the day. Um, so, the discussion of public-private partnerships is often a discussion, it seems to me, about economics. I'm a political economist by training, by the way. Um, to me, that's a mistake. Economics is just math. What we really need to talk about is values. We need to be values aligned in our work that informs the type of economics we want to build. It's the approach we take at Raven. The other, one, other thing, there's an innovation that came about many, many thousands of years ago called sitting around the council fire. And you sit around it and you talk to each, you listen and you talk and you hear different perspectives, you work together and you collaborate, co-design and come up with solutions together. You've heard this today as well. Um, and I gotta even remember what I put on this. Um, Public-private partnerships, to me they're a wonderful thing. And no, they're not all perfect, not everything is. But it's a way of looking at problems, hopefully differently, and we've had 30 years of experience. What have they done? Provided alternative finance, shared risk, worked on big projects at scale, brought some private market efficiencies into a public good scenario. It's well suited, in my opinion, to very large projects or to larger projects, and that's how it's generally been thought of and used. So this kind of looks like bridges, hospitals, roads, toll roads, infrastructures, schools, large, large project takes large, large amounts of capital. And I'm gonna ask a question here next about what would happen if we started to look at this differently? What if we start to look at public-private partnerships through a lens on complex human issues? And so for us in our work, I didn't make the graphic, but the little heart's cute. Anyways, um, the key thing for this in me is the equity given in sort of the display in this Venn diagram of community and the role community plays. I come from an indigenous community and my identity is very attached to the community and to me that's where issues get solved, that's where, that's where the work gets done. So. Outcomes finance, so I don't talk about public-private partnerships, we talk about outcomes finance in this space. So what is, you know, outcomes finance? These are instruments, it's another tool in the toolkit, you heard this as well, that we can use. These are pay for performance, they've often been likened to social impact bonds. So social impact bonds are a narrow slice of the outcomes finance world. They've been employed globally for decades. What's it really about? It's about leveraging private capital, through an evidence-based system. So you can get high impact, innovative programs and services, human services, in spheres that haven't had it before. It incentivizes people in the right direction 
It incentivizes the private capital. I'm a private capital provider. It incentivizes the public good. Most importantly, the, super, the service providers in communities and the people who live there. And this becomes very important as you go through these exercises. It also brings in philanthropic capital, which is kind of nice. Why do this? Why do it now? Outcomes finance isn't relatively new. The way we talk about it maybe is. In the indigenous context, we're talking about a window of opportunity across the board. And you heard a little bit from Sherry and others today, where the opportunity is that you have the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Murder and Missing Women, Indigenous Women's Report, all these calls to action globally and locally. You have a massive, massive federal spend in the Indigenous space, which is eh, sort of going well. It's a lot of money. How effective is it? It's up for debate. I think it's only so effective. And I think it's an opportunity, and the words I'll use is for a different type of procurement from the federal system. We're used to procurement in the, in the P3 world. It's a different way to procure better outcomes. Most importantly, we have long-term evidence that spending more just doesn't necessarily work. We also have long-term evidence that the government involved in the lives of indigenous people, creating programs and services, tends to turn out badly. There are some good examples out there in recent years, but they're few and far between. So we have an opportunity space. And I want to raise something else here, because I think it's important as I was taking the train in this morning, that lovely piece of public infrastructure from Ottawa here. Um, is there two kind of driving outside factors where I think a different type of public-private partnership needs to work? Um, and I'll try to get to this in my clock running here, so I'll try to get to it fairly quickly. One is the pandemic and the post-pandemic and what it taught us and what it taught us we're really bad at in this country and many others. And the second thing is climate change and adaptation and what it taught us we're really bad at this country and many others. And that's community resilience. Building resilience in community to actually deal with these. If you talk about atmospheric rivers and droughts and... Um, you know, it's one of the communities I work in, they couldn't get food door to door. And these are people with diabetes and other issues, and you couldn't get food. We were donating our personal money at Raven into communities in the north to make sure that food was flown in. We have a community resilience issue. And I think public and private partnerships, at least the way I think of them, is a way at that. Um, I'm trying to remember all my slides here. Yeah, let's go to this one. And it's the fifth of those star-like bullets. The, deep, the need for deep community resilience in there. It also takes advantage of new money in the ecosystem. I work in private capital, and I can tell you private capital, and I think there's some in the room here, is looking for a way to have high social impact, looking for vehicles and ways to invest that money, obviously in a shared risk environment. And it's out there, and I'll, I'll come again to it um, uh, towards the end. So this next slide, bear with me. I usually spend an hour explaining this, which I won't do to you today. This is the flow of capital in an outcomes finance model, where you have impact investors bringing money in, you support indigenous social enterprises, you know your outcomes before you even start. You agree and build them with the community, which you see at the center. What is it the thing that we want to do? What does success actually look like for us? So no money is moved yet. And we've done this on type 2 diabetes. We spent three years doing an indigenous solutions lab with six indigenous communities. We're co-creating interventions. We're about to launch that into an outcomes contract. And it is critical to do that that way. And I'll talk a little bit maybe in a second about type 2 diabetes. Then we work with indigenous social enterprises and the community. Why? Because if the community doesn't own the intervention, it doesn't stick. It doesn't last. So the community needs to be at the center of it. You measure the outcomes, do an independent third party. They get repaid, generally by government agencies at an agreed upon performance rate kicker. The money goes back into the system. That's how the model works, as quick as I can do it. So I'm now halfway through. So let's talk about what happens that we've noticed, because we've deployed two of these. So for indigenous communities, there's a set of benefits, we call them, just to keep it simple to the investors, to the outcomes purchasers, and to indigenous communities. 
And they're not always obvious benefits, but they, some really interesting things occurs when you're working with community. And I actually should pause for a moment because the one thing I wanted to raise, the way that we work at Raven is we follow our indigenous values and we try to work holistically. We work on two issues, climate and health. We do this for a reason. We think they're interconnected, first of all. And it's what the community tells us they want to work at. But the most important thing that we do as an intermediary is we build relationships and we manage the relationships. Manage is kind of a trite word for it. We build, we don't actually sign MOUs. We don't sign those sort of agreements. We sign relationship agreements where I agree to be in relationship with you. And what this means when times get tough, and they do get tough, doing these complex interventions, like we do geothermal and air source and ground source and on-reserve housing, type 2 diabetes interventions, things will get tough. It's the community that gets your back. It's that relationship that matters and allows you to solve problems consistently over time. I, I, we're, we come from a gifting culture. I often go into a community. I have to be invited first. We sit down with chief and council. Then we sit with elders, with the aunties, with the children, and we understand What's at play? What's the strength? What's the levers? Very much to the way I think that we heard from uh, the architect this morning about how you can build in community and it becomes your foundation. Something I hope they would have done with the Ottawa LRT, but that wasn't the case. Um, the simple lesson in this is those closest to the problem know how to solve it. They know who needs to be there, who's going to champion it, and who has to solve it on the ground. Um, so I'm still at benefits. I luckily have eight minutes left, or lucky for you, I only have eight minutes left. Um, what this means here is the benefits don't stay with one sector. They don't stay with one stakeholder. It crosses a bunch of things. And I'm working in communities that are really not well off. You have 70, 60 to 70 percent rates of unemployment. In the communities where we're doing type 2 diabetes, if you're, if you're indigenous in Canada, you're under the age of 25, you have 80% chance of being type 2 diabetes in your life. You will die 17 years earlier, and you will lead a worse quality of life overall. So I can, while I can get excited about toll roads, I get much more excited about saving people's lives. It also saves culture, which is transmitted orally down through our people. This is where I think we can have more impact. This is what, and at the table, this Indigenous Solutions Lab table, is three levels of government and a whole bunch of actors. Diabetes Canada's in the room, Novo Nordisk is in the room. They're sitting at the table with community. All sectors, very diverse. There's 45 people at the table. It's a little bit like herding cats at times, but they work really, really well together to kind of bring out all the, uh, all the things that you need to think about and you need to do. So I'm gonna speed up here. Where do we start? We started actually in climate change, in geothermal. We did a $5.1 million outcomes contract we did 125 homes on reserve. CMHC bought those outcomes and then gave us more money than we asked for. Now, why did they do that? It's a weird thing to do for government. Because they realized that we had the relationships to actually help the other sides of their program. And we did it at no benefit to us, at a, at a zero cost, because what we're interested in is on reserve geothermal housing. Why? Indigenous energy, sovereignty, clean air in the house. You get air conditioning where you've never had it. You're doing high HVAC level employment jobs, taking people off social assistance. The benefits are on and on and on. And they all stay in the community and the value stays in the community. CMHC then approached us and said, we'd like to do 400 plus. That's about 22 million-ish worth of housing. Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta and potentially Northern Ontario now. That was just the other day. So we started here because energy is just a little bit easier. It's known. We created a social value rate card to actually make it work. Where did that take us to? So at Raven, we're good at running funds. This is what we do. We're investors. So next week, we will launch the Indigenous Outcomes Fund. We'll start raising capital against the Indigenous Outcomes Fund. A $50 million pool of capital to do exactly this sort of work. And I have about 35 or 40 million of it lined up already wants to go through the due diligence process. Because it's high impact, it's not like a venture capital fund where you're trying to get 20x you know, rates of return on things. It's not like that at all. It's a very reasonable 7 to 9% rate of return on the fund. 
But what you do get is this massive outcomes and massive impacts, which we measure from the beginning. So you're not searching for it at the end. And then we verify it by third parties, and you get a fund. It's the first of its type in Canada. It's the first indigenous one in the world. There's only one other fund in North America who are friends of ours in the United States running a community outcomes fund. We have the fund fully filled with projects already. So as soon as we launch it, we know all the projects we want to do. And the communities keep calling. Because it just doesn't apply to health and climate, although that's enough work. But workforce development, homelessness, recidivism, child and family services, it applies all in the same way. Why do a fund? It's just easier to move capital that way. It's easier to kind of pool it. You build a center of expertise around something, and then we're able to help our communities out. What will the fund look like? This is a shameless plug. This is what the fund will look like. Two to five year contracts. Average deal size are two to seven million. Six to eight investments in the fund. What's happening here to me is a way of building a market around a different type of a P3 model. And we're doing only indigenous community. Like we're not looking outside that right now because we've got enough work to do with this. So that's, that's what's coming. I put a couple slides on the end and I totally strayed from my notes. I'm sure I had really important things to say in here. But um, what does the global market look like on outcomes finance? That's what it looks like. And if you can read it, it's obviously growth uh, in the market. Here's where there's outcomes funds operating globally in those locations that you see in black. And one in Denmark, which actually we take some inspiration for. There's a type 2 diabetes one in the city of Aarhus, which I went to visit last fall to see it in operation, and it was really good. Really good. A way to get better human outcomes overall. So what I think is happening, or what we feel is happening, is we're starting to see the development of a movement. We're starting to see the development of an ecosystem. But I want to bring up another point. What I think we're hoping to do, and it's kind of we're in a triangle situation, where you have outcomes purchasers, which are governments at different levels. You have investors at one corner, and then you have the communities at the other corner. And Raven sits in the middle to intermediate these relationships, which are a series of contracts. Contract's not necessarily a bad word, but they're co-designed contracts uh, inside it. What I think is going on here is what we're trying to do is, one of the things, I hope, is to rewire how governments think of doing procurement. Because right now, if you're an indigenous community, it's a hard box to fill. You want to do type 2 diabetes prevention in your community? Good luck, Chuck. It is not going to happen too easily. They sent a, met a program about 10, 15 years ago. It does good things, but it's way too small. Um, the other thing we want to do is redirect capital. So indigenous communities are basically drinking from the straw of private capital, and we need the fire hose. All these things create long-term internal community resiliency. They create jobs. And for us, we keep the wealth, that means people and money, in communities to do the good work that we need them to do there. It's in the couple of contracts that we've done, it's been transformational. And I'll do, I've got one minute, so I'm gonna tell a story. Geothermal, so in one of the, in Peguis First Nation, Southern Manitoba, we did some geothermal installation. And the community prioritized doing all the grandma's house first, which an indigenous value, that, let's work with our grandma's first. One of the grandma's got, the geothermal system in her house, which A, for the first time, gave her air conditioning along with this clean heat source and a 50% reduced energy bill, et cetera. But the air conditioning turned out to be more important than we could have imagined. Because what she told us after is that all the grandkids came over and all their friends to hang out, because it's air conditioned. Southern Manitoba in the summer is pretty hot. And what she started to do was to tell all traditional stories and teachings and to translate culture orally to these kids who weren't otherwise going to do it. So these are some of the spin-off side effect benefits that we had. This is not what you expected as a conversation about public-private partnerships. I gather that. But I mean, we, we can talk infrastructure, and I think there's modifications and changes that need to happen inside that to do things better. I think there's interesting lessons inside 
the work that we've started about how we take an indigenous approach to this, which means we build relationships first. We're very intentional about it, and it always comes first before the money, uh, before we get into that conversation at all. So that's it. Okay, I'm sitting over here we'll, right now. Yeah, we'll take our, take our seats over here. Uh, great, thank you, Jeff. That was, that was a, very interesting, uh, a very interesting presentation. Just got some things to ask you about that. Um, and if anyone has their own questions as well, we will take questions from the audience and we'll also take questions online if you're joining us virtually. So uh, just uh, raise your hand if you have a question and we'll, we'll get a mic to you and, and, and you, can, you can ask, ask away. Uh, but, but Jeff, let me just start by asking you because your, your approach is different than the traditional P3 model that, that has been discussed today. So I guess how do you think about how your work intersects, maybe overlaps with, with that, that, that traditional P3 model? Yeah, I was trying to think about that on the way down here. And if you think of it as a, like a bar on a chart and it's got different striations and P3 for big infrastructure has got this big block of it at the bottom, then the method of working with human services, um, really critical to everyone's growth and development and who they are, who we are as people in Canada, it's the additive chunk that comes on top of it. And it may not be monetarily as large, but I'll, I'll give you an example. Like the, the $50 million fund wasn't an idea seven months ago. What happened is a bunch of investors approached us, a bunch of outcomes buyers approached us. So all of a sudden you're starting to think to operate at scale. And now we've filled out the fund in theory already, which is unusual. I raised a $100 million fund last year. It's very unusual to have your whole deal flow out in front of you before you even open the doors on the fund. So I think it's additive in the ecosystem and it's doing different things with capital and we need a whole bunch of these tools uh, at work to do things. And you talked a lot about uh, outcomes financing. Uh, and, and so how, how established is outcome-based financing here in Canada? Like, is, is this, I guess, a common thing that we see, or is it still kind of rare? No, it's pretty rare. I mean, we've had a couple of attempts at what I call the heydays of social impact bonds to try to think about it that way. I think there's been about eight in Canada, not outcomes contracts in the way that we conceive of them. We've done the two, but there's, there were eight others. And, there's a little bit of danger in how the, those were the heydays when everyone's talking about social finance but not really understanding it, trying to do these kind of funky new things and attract everyone to it. The problem was they didn't set the outcomes very well at the beginning. It's very data heavy. You've got to know exactly what you want to do and how you're going to do it and have it all evidence-based out. I know way more about type 2, type 2 diabetes than I ever should. Like I've read a hundred research articles and I understand the science of it just so that we, and we're not the experts, we'll hire experts, but just so that we can get to the, like, so the outcomes are known in advance, what you want to hit. You know, we had this conversation in Canada over the last five or six months uh, as we negotiated massive multi-billion dollar deals with each provincial government about, guess what, health outcomes measures. How are we going to get to better health outcomes? Mm -hmm. The answer to that was to reduce surgical waiting times, add more nurses and doctors. Those are all great things. What was missing in the debate was, how about you try to stop people from getting sicker first? You actually save more money and have more impact on people's lives to flip the equation. 97% of healthcare is spent on reaction, surgeries, medicines, that sort of thing. 3% is spent on prevention. It's a terrible situation to be in. It makes no sense. But it's very difficult to flip people's, to flip government entities and people's thinking on it. So we're going to try to do it by example. Hmm. I don't even know if I answered your question at this point. We started with outcomes, <laughs> that's what it was. So. Well, well so, so let me ask you, like, what, what's holding us back? Like, what would allow us to, to have more of these? Uh, I mean, I think we have to create the vehicles and pathways that, that, and, and show successes. You know, not unlike, I think, what I heard on the other panel about showing the successes of P3s. People love to talk about failure, but showing the successes is equally important being able to really measure and communicate the outcomes. 53% of people reduced their A1C blood sugar. This led to this economic benefit. 
And we're not putting it in words that I think, first of all, two, two or three different sectors at play, and then now comes finance arrangement. And they look at issues differently. Although they're seeing the same data, they're, they're looking at it from a different lens. So you need to talk in the language of those who you're seeing there. If you want to talk to government, talk about government long-term savings. You know, we've got to talk to them where they're at. Yeah. The diabetes one's a good example. So we know in the four communities that we're working with, we did what's called a um, burden of illness study, very detailed one, which Novo Nordis actually helped fund. Adam, if you're in the room, you'll remember this a few years back. And we discovered that in those communities this year, 90 to 95 people be diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. That's on top of the 1,900 people in those communities already with it. That 90 to 95 people represents $25 million of new costs starting this year on top of the other top, lifetime costs. So you're starting to see the numbers at play, the cost, and that's only the people who get diagnosed, by the way. They're just enormous. So we have an opportunity, and we're talking about a $25 million outcomes contract in those communities. The cost savings alone, I think we have to hit a 19% success rate in stabilizing people with their A1C levels just to hit that sort of a repayment, that sort of cost savings to government entities. I think it's just thinking about the issue differently and being able to communicate clearly hmm. uh, about it. Interesting. Uh, if anyone has a question, just raise your hand. We can, we can get to, to questions in the room. Okay, we do have a, a question over there. Maybe in, in over here, if we can get one over there. Okay, great. I think we've got a mic over there, so we'll start on this end. Thank you. Um, when I look at the uh, outcomes fund, uh, investment return is sort of 6 or 9%. Uh, who are the uh, most uh, investors that want to invest in your funds when the inflation, the inflation rate is like a 6 or 7%? Are they making money when the inflation runs like a 7%? Yeah, if I think if I understand your, correction, your question correctly. Most of the investors who invest in our fund are doing it, like this is a small fund. In the investment space, this is small. Uh, they're doing it because they want to create social impact and what they're seeking most of all is preservation of capital. We'll preserve the capital, make a little bit on it. Something we're doing unique with this fund that hasn't been done, as far as I know, is we as the general partner in the fund at Raven, we would actually you know, get to share in some of the profits. We are taking 75 to 80% of our profits and putting it back into the charitable foundation to do more of this work. So we're actually giving up our own profit on it. Why? Because the work's really important. These are people's lives that we're talking about here. I think a lot of the investors are seeing things somewhat similarly in that way. They're seeing it as it's just important things that need to get done, which society's been pretty bad at doing up until now, to be honest. Hope that that gets to your question. So earlier, Jeff, you said we need to think about things differently. Is, is, I mean, is this part of what you meant by saying that? This is this part of what I meant. I don't know any other fund that's doing it to that level, unless they're a pure philanthropic fund. Hmm. Um, so we're going to try it. We've got a bunch of interested investors, so we'll see what they say come next week. Um, but the interest is very high. So. And the interest is high from Canada, uh, United States, and Europe, where we have con so a lot of different outside. So like two or three people we know in the US who, who we worked with before said, yeah, we want in. So just, just let us know when it starts. OK. We had a couple other questions in the room. I know one over there, and then I think one back there. We'll start here first. Hi. Um, I have a question about the barriers to accessing capital for social justice uh, initiatives. I recently co-founded a nonprofit which has a justice reform focus for reintegrating black and indigenous uh, in, indig individuals from the justice system, but we also have a solution to save, uh, to, to address the labor market crisis across all sectors. We opted to, after about a year of conversations, trying to find an organization that was bold enough to champion this and be the lead partner. It crosses every sector. Mm -hmm. um, we opted to start a nonprofit just because that was the clearest pathway to cash. Um, so in terms of, like, we would really like to be a social enterprise, but in terms of having startup capital for two, you know, elder millennials, it was not easy. So what would your advice be in terms of those types of initiatives and how you can access capital for your organization or project? Yeah, it's a long answer actually to that. But the, it depends on how much capital you're seeking and to do what with it. I mean, there's a bunch of organizations. This is the power of philanthropy. It starts in the early part of it. 
of the capital stack. You get philanthropy coming in to help lead. You get some government programs, mostly philanthropy coming into it. And then it's a question, if, if you're moving into a social enterprise, have you monetized the, the, the service or the good that you're providing just so that people who invest know what they're creating with it? It's unfortunate to use those language to monetize a human service, but we do it all the time, frankly. It's provinces do it all the time. They're the experts in, in doing that. And then as you grow, then you get into different types of capital. And there's different types of investors interested in different things. I know it's not getting too specific with you, but it's, it's what you're looking for the money to do and to do it when, and, and seeking good partnerships. And we had a lot of people support Raven in the early days because we're the only private indigenous VC firm in North America, probably globally, uh, which we didn't know when we started. We had no idea at the time. We were trying to answer the truth and reconciliation calls, and we were addressing the capital gap at the time. That was our, our goal, really, was to say, can we do it? That's why we had a $5 million, I think it's funny now. Our target was a $5 million fund. And the reason, because the financial system is systemically racist, unconsciously systemically racist. So when we showed up at the, at the investment committee table with our pitch deck on the fund, we were getting some strange responses from people at first. Then we had a couple leading foundations who kind of came in and said, no, this is the right thing to do. And I'd known them for, through previous work. I said, yeah, let's, let's try to do this. And so like In Spirit Foundation, Lawson Foundation, McConnell, a couple of them came in. And once that, I mean, investors are like pack animals. And no one wants to be first. Everyone wants to be second, right? So they kind of followed on. And so $5 million turned to 25 in like nine months. It was very quick. And that's during the pandemic when People put their head in the sand for this. Investors put their head in the sand for the first six weeks and didn't know what was going on. But it turns out there's a lot of capital out there looking for a home. The second fundraise was a lot easier. I also went to Oxford and trained in social finance and VC. Why? Because I'm an indigenous guy. And if I didn't go to Wharton or Queens or something, then people didn't believe you were the person to do it. The last thing that we need is a bunch of Wharton MBAs running around indigenous communities doing investments. That's going to really turn out badly, by the way, if they can even get into the communities. So that's kind of why I did that. It was very purposeful. Uh, a little bit earlier there, you, you mentioned the TRC and how that's driven a lot of your work. I guess I wonder how, how much of a role it plays day to day. And, and if other organizations are, are kind of looking to maybe do something similar, how, how do they get started on that? There's a lot, there's, there's a number of organizations and companies in Canada that have led the way in creating reconciliation action plans. Some of the banks have done it, even some of the big oil companies. You take the Suncors, Deloitte did it. There's a number out there. Some of them are, are pretty good. Some of them are only okay. But the fact that someone's doing it is really important and understanding. I mean, there, there's a business purpose. People are to some degree looking for social license to work in indigenous communities. I'll just be frank with folks. That is a thing, especially around resource extraction. But the, I come from a school of thought where it's always better to engage than to push at the outside. I'd rather engage and, and bring them into the tent. How much of a role is TRC playing today? Unfortunately, the word reconciliation may be losing some of its charm because it's been out since 2015 and earlier than that with the commission. But um, what we know from, from studies and, and, and the economics of it, the more that we engage and include indigenous people build the wealth of indigenous communities, the better it is for Canada as a whole. Um, and it's kind of a, it's a historical wrong that needs to be righted on the other side of the ship. So it guides us. I think the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is really powerful as well. And it holds Canada to account internationally. I used to be a negotiator on for government and then for indigenous people, of both sides of that table for years. It's a really important tool. And we actually track all our investments to the impact it's having on the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. So when people report on impact, we report to that. We do SDGs as well, but SDGs are like, you can drive a couple semis through the SDGs, they're that wide. Like you, we're trying to get very specific on what, what's happening in people's lives and communities. And so we track to those. Again, I lost the original question, but I <laughs> well, you, talk, you talked a bit about the, the TRC, and it's interesting to, to kind of see, you know, the, where it started and the day-to-day -day now, maybe. Um, I'll just do a quick check. I don't know if we have any online questions at the moment, uh, if there's anybody there. 
Yeah, yeah uh, okay. there is a question from the virtual audience, Manika, uh, asking if the model could be used um, to help close the gap in terms of clean water in indigenous communities, uh, given that the timelines stated by the government have just come and gone multiple times. Yeah, I get this question about once a week. Uh, we don't work in the water space. So I think the short answer is yes. There's a longer answer, though, to it. We don't work in the water space. Well, hey, we're busy, but two, it's it's not a greenfield area, meaning oops, there's lots of um, um, actors in the space, including the government putting a lot of capital at work with different organizations trying to do different things. And we don't really want to muddy that water. That's probably a bad expression to use, but we really don't want to get into that that space. Where I think using an outcomes-based approach would be handy in water is the ongoing um, uh, maintenance and running of on-reserve water systems. One of the problems that has occurred in a bunch of it is you highly train people in community and then they go and find a good job that's paying twice as much in the city. But if you can have more community ownership and leadership in it, I think you can develop a different model to kind of stabilize the role of highly trained individuals and the community's sense of buy-in to the solution. It's tough for some communities that have been facing 40 years of boiled water advisory and mercury poisonings. Like, it's tough, especially when you realize you're forcibly moved to this area through colonialism. And, you know, we don't need to go down that path. So it's possible. Yes, it can be applied there, like it can to recidivism and a, and a bunch of other serious issues. Okay. I know there was, uh, we have a few minutes left. There's another question on this side of the room, so we'll, we'll, we'll go here. Uh, and I, we might have time for a couple more questions, so uh, if you raise your hand, we'll get to you. I think uh, you, what you project to the like a model for dealing with diabetes type 2, of course, is not restricted to indigenous communities. It's a problem that other communities in Canada have. Are you suggesting that this, this is kind of a, a template that we can apply and scale up across Canada? And if so, how, how we're going to do it with uh, kind of the, the peculiar setting in the Canadian healthcare system where uh, I believe data is fragmented uh, between multiple entities and to measure, really to, to have the outcome measures, you need to collect the data so you can actually show the value. How you, how you were able to solve this in your uh, indigenous project, and will this be applicable across Canada? So short answer, yes. I think it's applicable, and you can scale it. It doesn't mean it's not without its complications, though. And you hit the nail on the head, a sort of you know, bifurcated Canadian healthcare system where data rests in different places. And in the indigenous case, some of it rests in Ottawa, some of it rests in the community, and some of it rests with the province. So we had three. So that's the whole burden of illness study, when we had to kind of unpack and figure it out where the data was and collect it together. This is prior to doing any work. We had to figure this out. Um, I don't think the problem is too complex that it can't be solved. The, the, it, and it's, I think it's easier outside the indigenous space to some degree, by the way, because the data is only in two spots. Then, you know, so you can kind of get to it a bit better. But I think we can provide a template. The, the template that we use at Raven is, again, more about the relationship, is how we brought people to the table, how we keep them there, how you center the community voices at the table. And you learn all these sort of game-changing things. One of the health directors in this Four Arrows Regional Health Authority sat at the table in the very first meeting she says to me, or she says openly in front of everyone, and we did ceremony and to start it off, heavy ceremony, getting to know each other before we even talk about the issue. She had 10 siblings and lost nine of them to type two, including through amputations and you know the collateral uh, comorbidities of, you know, heart and stroke and, and other issues. And, um, the deep personal impact, see, I'm way off your question. The deep personal impact was really important to maintaining the momentum at the table and, 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 and grounds us years later, it grounds us. And she's still there. And her 27-year-old son had to get a, a, a transplant recently. Like, it's just ridiculous. And it... it but it can be applied to other jurisdictions and it, and it can be applied outside indigenous communities. What I think we want to do is, I'm very pragmatic 
Let's prove it, execute, get it done, measure it, show people, do it again, do it again, do it again. Create a market out of it where we're kind of doing it uh, uh, a lot faster with other communities. And plus, we're getting faster at it. You can't, re oh, I'm over time. You can't replace the, um, the process, this indigenous lab process that we did. It happened during COVID, so it was like three years. It should have taken about 18 months. You can't replace that because that's where you build your relationships with everybody right at the beginning. And you anchor down on those relationships and then it just kind of, it rolls along. But we're more efficient now with it. That, that seems like a, a pretty good place to wrap up this conversation. Uh, thank you to everyone who asked questions. Jeff, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs>
And there are some very powerful examples that are underway right here, right now in this city. Collaboration and partnership that address these challenges. But first, before citing a few examples, a little bit of background about us, about Daniels and our trajectory as a company and how partnerships have really informed that growth and trajectory. So I joined our founder, John Daniels, in 1984, after 11 years working in the not-for-profit housing world, co-op housing in Montreal and developing co-op housing here in Toronto as well. 11 years from 73 to 84, and then I joined John Daniels. I was 33 at the time. Mr. Daniels was 57, but already he was a legend in the real estate development com uh, community for having taken Cadillac Fairview Development Corporation across North America. Now, my background in affordable housing provided this truly natural connectivity to the not-for-profit sector. The result of that was the development of over 3,600 homes, deeply affordable homes, with nonprofit co-ops, with church groups, with service organizations, with cities, municipalities, and regional governments. 3,600 homes we built between 1984 and 1995. How did we do that? We did it under a hugely successful public-private partnership model. Simple. Unfortunately, in June of 1995, the provincial government here in Ontario walked away entirely from affordable housing, pushed away from the table, following their federal counterparts who left the affordable housing world in 1984. So the feds got out in 1984. The province of Ontario got out in 1995. And now we look back and think, why do we have a crisis of affordability? Well, it's pretty simple. Government investment on an ongoing basis is necessary. Now, in June of 1995, when that happened, the theory, and it was the same theory that the feds used back in 1984, the theory was that if government got out of the way and the private sector unfettered was allowed to build, that somehow there would be homes that would be built for everyone. That was magical thinking, mystical thinking, and in fact, misguided thinking. Because the reality, as we now know, looking back over these decades, is exactly the opposite. But there is good news. I'm always one to look for the good news. And the good news is that the federal government, about six years ago, said, hey, we're back. And the feds did come back and actually established, hallelujah, a national housing strategy. But they also, over the period of the few years after that, committed $82 billion in order to address the crisis in affordability across the country. That's the good news. The not so good news is that $82 billion doled out over a period of 10 years, and that was the plan, is nowhere near enough to address the crisis. It doesn't even cut it, it doesn't come close. And that brings me right back to partnership, further, faster, deeper, as the way to address affordability. Now I've said it already, long-term consistent government investment in affordable housing is essential, the basic fundamental building block. And that, however, alone won't cut it either. We need today a whole of community response, a whole of community response to creating affordable housing. For one, developers need to weigh in. Developers need to say, yes, we will integrate affordable housing into our new communities, into our subdivisions, into our rental housing. But also the philanthropic sector has a significant role to play, nurturing and funding deeply affordable housing. Why? And we heard a bit of it, this from Jeffrey a few minutes ago. As a primary social determinant of health. There's no doubt we can reduce the cost of health care. 
We can reduce the cost of health care. How? By eliminating homelessness. By building transitional and supportive housing. By building deeply affordable housing that will remain affordable in perpetuity. That's how we can reduce the cost of health care. So developers, private sector needs to weigh in. Philanthropic sector needs to weigh in. Everybody needs to lean in. But the other good news is once everybody has decided this is important and we're going to lean in, there are very cost-effective models that have been road tested, that are tried and true, that we know how they work. Cost-effective models by which affordable housing can be created today. Now, for example, the Partnership for Affordable Living program, this has got a great acronym, the PAL program. The PAL program was created in Regent Park with Bentall Green Oak on behalf of Sun Life Financial, with Wood Green Community Services, and with the City of Toronto, all coming together with us as partners, creating deeply affordable homes, rental homes, that are integrated within a market rental building. This is a model, the PAL program, that is replicable, it is cost effective, it can be taken on the road across the country tomorrow morning. Now, that's a rental model, but also ownership, affordable ownership models are right here. We know what they are, we know how they work. Imagine, just imagine for a moment, if every builder, every developer, decided that they would sell one, two, or three homes in every subdivision, in every condominium, to Habitat for Humanity. Well, we know the impact. We've done it for the past 25 years. The impact on the developer's bottom line, guess what? Minuscule, marginal, nothing. But the impact on the Habitat partner family is truly life-changing. We also know that there's another home ownership model, again, that's been proven. The Partnership for Affordable Home Ownership, PAH, not as cool as PAL. The Partnership for Affordable Home Ownership, we know, and we know this from experience with several hundred households. We know that it works in its shared equity down payment assistance. These programs work providing a hand up to tenants into home ownership and in providing that hand up into home ownership, we are providing an opportunity for that household to build equity, to build generational wealth, and yes, to break the cycle of poverty. These programs work. There's no mystery, as I said, how we got here. It's really clear. But there's also no mystery how to move forward. And final note on this affordable chapter. Simply building more homes faster, and you've probably heard that, simply building more homes faster will not address the crisis of affordability. We need much more than that. Now, if we're going to build inclusive communities, yes, affordability has to be at the heart of it. But accessibility also needs to be at the heart of what we do. Why? So that every one of us, every one of us feels welcome everywhere. Not just in our offices or public buildings where it's mandated to be accessible, but in our homes where we live. And that brings me to the Accelerating Accessibility Coalition, the AAC. This is a first-of-its-kind cross-sectoral community working day by day to create a more accessible Canada. Hallelujah for that. Now, as you'll see up on the screen, the Urban Land Institute Toronto District is acting as the secretariat. Thank you, Richard Joy and the team from ULI for stepping up into this hugely important role. But take a look at all the organizations from the accessibility community. 
that have determined that this is important, not just to be working on their own, but in fact to come together in a coalition with developers and builders, with the real estate development community. And I see some of you in the room today. So thank you for being here and thank you for being part of this really important and powerful movement. And also part of this coalition are civic institutions and our post-secondary educational institutions. Together, hand in hand, this formidable coalition is already making an impact with an open source accessibility toolbox. Meg, that is the coolest slide, thank you. The accessibility toolbox. Because what this is doing right now is demonstrating how accessibility can be built in at virtually no additional cost rather than be bolted on after the fact at considerable additional cost to homeowners and to tenants. Take a moment, grab that QR code. Join this movement today, seriously. It's really important and we'd love to have you part of it. Affordability, accessibility, income disparity. Well, I'm now going to talk about another hugely important and exciting initiative happening right here in Toronto. And again, it's all based on people coming together in partnership. It's called, and this acronym is absolutely the best, if you haven't heard of ILIO until now, you will hear about ILIO for the months and years to come. Inclusive Local Economic Opportunity. ILIO is demonstrating right now how to build inclusive communities. Daniele Zanotti of United Way and Daryl White of BMO kicked off the ILIO process by bringing 20 influential corporate leaders to the table. But you know what? They brought the 20 influential corporate leaders to the table not just to talk amongst themselves, but in fact, to share that table with people from local community, from people on the ground in community who experience the challenges. So there it is. There's an incredible leadership team, a powerful leadership team from the corporate sector, from the philanthropic sector, nonprofits from the ground and local stakeholders, from the greater Golden Mile neighborhood in Scarborough. Now the ILIO journey is just beginning, but it is already making an impact in Greater Golden Mile with pilot projects that are underway right now, well before the first shovel actually hits the ground. ILIO is brilliant. It is a partnership model about building inclusive neighborhoods, inclusive communities. It is a Toronto, made in Toronto approach to building strong and inclusive communities through partnership and collaboration. Now, partnership. There are so many ways that partnerships can come to life. And there's one I want to address right now, which is the true magic, the magic that can happen at the intersection of business and the arts. I love this slide. Does anybody know what this is? Of course you do. Who has been to Tiff Bell Lightbox? Anybody been to a movie? Oh, pretty much everybody. Tiff Bell Lightbox in the heart of the entertainment district. This is one of the amazing examples of partnership at work. I know I walk into that building still to this moment, and you go in the front doors and I think, how did this happen? How could something like this be done? And the answer is really simple. It was done through partnership, through bringing people together. Now, I want to just take a sidebar to a, how did it start? The start of this journey, for us at least, was one day I'm sitting in my office, and I get a phone call from Steve Diamond. Many of you may know Steve. At the time, and this was 2003, Steve was one of the foremost development lawyers in the city. Steve calls me and he says, Mitchell, how would you like to meet Ivan Reitman? Have you seen the movie Ghostbusters, Mitchell? 
Have you seen Animal House or Meatballs? Well, I'd like to introduce you to Ivan Reitman. So Steve introduced us to Ivan on the right there. That's my partner, John Daniels. Steve introduced us to Ivan Reitman, and truly the rest is history. That led in a very direct line to a partnership between Ivan and his family, our company, but most importantly, with this non-profit charitable institution called TIFF, Toronto International Film Festival Group. But then, together, we brought all levels of government to the table. Everybody came to the table, corporate sector, philanthropic sector, and TIFF, 13 years later, right now, 13 years later, is this incredible destination for film lovers from around the world and from our city as well. But so importantly is that TIFF is also bringing hundreds of millions of dollars of value to our city. And even more important, TIFF is nurturing filmmakers, people in front of the camera, people behind the camera, supporting inclusive local economic opportunity in supporting an industry that is such an important industry here in our city. Now, TIFF is an amazing example, but there's one more I'd like to cite, and that's Daniel Spectrum in the heart of Regent Park. Who's been to Daniel Spectrum? Hopefully everybody. Lots of hands, many hands. Daniel Spectrum in the heart of Regent Park, again, stands proudly at that intersection of business and the arts. This cultural hub, 60,000 square feet, is a public-private partnership. There it is again. Public-private partnership between Toronto Community Housing, Artscape, and most importantly, residents of the Regent Park community. Daniel Spectrum is a fundamental building block of the overall revitalization. Now, we could probably spend an entire session talking about Regent Park and how partnership is at the heart of everything that has happened there. But let me try to boil it down to one very clear pathway. You know, people ask all the time, how did this happen? How did the revitalization get going? How has it come to where it's come to today after 17 years? The answer is so simple. It took bold leadership at the City of Toronto very specifically, very specifically, it took a willingness to embrace a public-private partnership model in which risk and reward are shared. That's what it took. And when we then had partnership at the heart of the agenda in Regent Park, our team went into the neighborhood and listened deeply to local voices, listened deeply to the, the hopes and the dreams of local residents, but also to fears and anxiety. Listen to what those local voices were saying. And then, having heard that, we mobilized the corporate sector and the philanthropic sec sectors in order to what? To expand our reach. There's a couple amazing examples. For example, Jennifer Torrey and the team from RBC, and thank you for being here, some of the RBC team. It's great to see you. Jennifer Torrey and the team from RBC planted their corporate flag in Regent Park on day one. This was a hugely powerful vote of confidence for the revitalization at a moment in time when conventional wisdom was saying that the revitalization would fail that we would never sell one condominium unit in this highly, highly stigmatized neighborhood. It was at a moment in time when, may I dare, dare I say it, the Globe and, Mile, Globe and Mail pronounced that the revitalization was doomed to failure. That was many years ago. And the work of RBC and other corporate and philanthropic partners has proved all of that wrong. There also came to the table the incredible partners from the MLSE Foundation, who raised over $3 million to create the Regent Park Athletic Grounds. There were a host of other initiatives, including the Journey Musical, a fundraiser in support of Daniel Spectrum. That's Jackie Richardson up there with kids from the neighborhood. 
performing in the Journey musical, but the Journey musical and other initiatives of that nature brought everybody to the table. Banks, insurance companies, trades, suppliers, consultants, our unions, post-secondary institutions. Everybody came to the table, and guess what? Here's the important part. Yes, they came to the table with some charitable dollars, but even more importantly, they came with apprenticeships, with scholarships, with bursaries, not just with jobs, but with career path opportunities. That was powerful. Because that allowed all of us to build social infrastructure hand in hand with the physical, with the bricks and the mortar. Today, Regent Park is recognized as the gold standard. The gold standard by which a truly challenged inner city neighborhood, stigmatized inner city neighborhood, can be reimagined and transformed. And in fact, just over a year ago, United Nations Habitat, UN Habitat, partnered with CMHC and the Urban Economy Forum to create the World Urban Pavilion in Regent Park. This is a global knowledge exchange hub from which best practices in building resilient, inclusive cities can be shared, can be gathered, can be studied, and yes, can then be projected around the world. Today, 17 years into the process, Meg's got a couple cool slides. This is what inclusion looks like on the ground in Regent Park. I love this last slide. This is a slide of the taste of Regent Park. And for those of you who haven't been to Regent Park or haven't experienced taste, I think it's every Wednesday throughout the summer, starting about July 7th or so. But do come to Regent Park on a Wednesday afternoon and you will feel and taste inclusion. So just before closing, and thank you so much for, for listening. I promised a small dash on sustainability because I have to, because it's important, because we know that catastrophic climate events are happening across the planet. At this moment, so far, not right here in our backyard, but so many different places. So we ask, and I'm sure you ask, what can you do? What can I do? What can we do? So we took a look at how we build our homes how we build our communities, and we created a decarbonization roadmap. And that roadmap includes very clear milestones on how we can build better buildings, better communities, lower our carbon footprint. And we're hoping that our industry will embrace either this roadmap or their own roadmap or grab onto Toronto Green Standards, which is really leading the way for municipalities across the country. We can't just wait till we are required to build better buildings. We have to start doing that right now. Private sector partners, N-Wave, Inucon, and many others are coming to the table. But I do want to put a little shout out there to our banks to come to the table and ask them, we need support. And I understand that it's important for banks to come together around this. But I think there's a tremendous opportunity that is here right now, today, for banks and government and private sector, but particularly the banks to come and create two new products. One will incentivize developers and builders to build better homes, to build lower carbon homes. And the second will incentivize consumers to buy those homes. That's what's needed, because I have no doubt whatsoever that when that train gets rolling, and it will get rolling, every bank, every builder, every developer, and every consumer will want to be part of the solution and not the problem. That's my dash on sustainability, so thank you for listening. Now, to close, boy, I'm right on time. I've got two minutes and 13 seconds. The shot clock is counting down in this last minute or so. There's a couple of very important footnotes. Firstly, let's be clear. 
None of this is easy. Collaboration and partnership takes work. Jeffrey mentioned intention, intentionality. But this work is essential. In fact, there's no doubt. Our future depends on it. So here is the ask to all of you here and to all of you in the virtual audience. The ask is simple. The ask is to lean in. The ask is to don't sit back, but in fact embrace partnership. Reach out to new partners. Reach out today to new partners across all sectors, all cultures, and all demographics. Reach out to indigenous housing providers, to Habitat for Humanity, to Covenant House, to Wood Green Community Services, and others who are working hard to create affordable homes. Reach out to Stop Gap, to Access Now, to the Accessible Housing Network, to the Rick Hansen Foundation. Reach out to people with lived experiences navigating the inaccessible realities of our built environments. Reach out to post-secondary institutions, to the United Way and to charitable foundations, helping them build individual capacity and community wealth. And then, having reached out, having reached out, invest the time, invest the energy, the effort, listening deeply to the wisdom of those partners. Because in listening, you will build respect and trust. And with those ingredients in our hands and in our hearts, with those ingredients right here, respect and trust, anything is possible. Anything is possible. As a community, we face enormous challenges. But as a community, we can solve them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitchell. That was great. Uh, that, that does conclude our program today, uh, but please do stay. There's some drinks and snacks just outside, so you can do a little bit of mingling. Uh, on behalf of the Globe and Mail, I would just like to thank all of you in the room today for being here and all of you virtually for joining us. Uh, I would also like to thank our partner, Novo, Novo Nordisk, for, for making the event possible today. Uh, so thank you so much, and uh, please enjoy uh, the snacks and drinks outside.